Welcome back to Metaphysics According to Magnus at Uppsala University. Today's date is April 14th, 1519. This week's lecture, we've arrived at an interesting point in history. A bit over 200 years ago, Duns Scotus, then known as Johannes Scott Duns, wrote a brief text asserting views on metaphysics. Scotus was an ordained priest and well-educated man, mostly known for lecturing and writing in England, France, and even Germany briefly before his death. His sarcophagus reads, Scotia mi genut, Anglia mi sociept, Gallia mi dociut, Colonia mi tenet. It's really beautiful, I thought so. Now, of course, you should be wondering why I bring in such a character as this into my class. The answer is simple. Scotus provides us with one of the clearest definitions and explanations of metaphysics. While still progressing in the field in a meaningful way, through his teaching on the university, on the invocity of being. You're familiar with the term being qua being from my lecture on Aristotle some time ago, and it has popped up here and there since then. Indeed, Scotus took this also as his narrow definition of metaphysics, that it is the study of being itself. Moreover, we can clarify that even categories of beings can be studied as beings within metaphysics, but if they are looked on as concepts, Scotus asserts that it is then just a study of within logic instead. About these categories, Scotus argues that there are exactly ten. Take note. They are substances, which are specifically being or existing in a truly independent sense while the following nine categories would be called accidents or accidental by both Scotus and Aristotle. Here they are. Quantity, quality, relation, action, passion, place, time, position, and finally, state. I've shortened the monologue portion of this lecture in order to allocate some time at the end for an interactive discussion to see if you can outthink Scotus by... Um, conceiving of additional or combining the stated categories into fewer. So that so keep that in mind throughout the rest of the lecture. I'm also eager to mention what I believe is Scotus' most important contribution to the field of metaphysics, before moving on to the prime content of the lecture. His belief in the univocity of being, and this, as you may already know, directly counters the better known Thomas Aquinas and truly nearly everyone else who has conceived of the difference at all. We will come back to univocative being a bit later. Let's examine the ever-popular distinctions between matter, form, body, and soul. Scotus, along with everyone else, maintained the Aristotelian, Aristotelian understanding of accidental change, which is a change in the accidents associated with or held within a substance. This is in distinction to substantial change, which occurs when a substance comes into being or ceases to exist. We can also use the terms of matter as what proceeds through substantial change along with substantial forms, which give matter their definite, unique, and individual substance, as well as accidental forms, which are a substance's accidental qualities in the same way that Aristotle formed the concepts. But Scotus doesn't quite stop there. There are three important distinctions that he makes, which evoked some disagreement from his contemporaries. There exists matter that has no form whatsoever. That's distinction number one. Distinction number two is not all created substances are composites of form and matter. Finally, the third and perhaps most important distinction is an individual substance may have more than one substantial form. As you can tell, these are very important distinctions uh, that, that Scotus ventures here. Let's examine them in turn. Prime matter is that matter which has no form whatsoever. It is unformed matter. It is unclear whether or not Aristotle believed in such a concept or not, although I tend to think that he did, in fact, conceive of prime matter as fact, due to the fact that he used it to assert substantial change, also as fact. 
The other side of the argument simply holds a more nuanced view of Aristotle. But anyways, and regardless, prime matter itself is still a topic of debate. This belief in prime matter logically leads us to the next important distinction, that not all created substances are composites of form and matter. This is easily arrived at by the example of prime matter itself. It is a substance, a real, material thing, yet it is by definition without form. This particular deviation from popular belief causes issues when conceiving of heavenly beings in particular, angels and God. Without prime matter, we are left with the popular equivocation of matter with potentiality and form with actuality. Yet with it, with prime matter, it is clear that matter is not potential, it is actual, even more actual than form. You should now be able to see where the disagreement with heavenly beings comes in. Those who do not assert prime matter see the angels as composites of form and some sort of spiritual material, and God as pure and perfect actuality or form. Now, onto the third distinction, that substances may have multiple substantial forms. It seems logical, given the definition of substantial forms, that we may need some number of them in order to bring forth an actual parcel of matter as a definite, unique, uh, as a definite, unique substance. Yet, let us think through a counterexample that will illuminate this topic. Here, we will conceive of the soul itself as the single substantial form of an individual. When this individual dies, their soul leaves causing substantial change to the person. That is to say, that the body that was the matter which was brought forth from its substantial form, the soul of that person, is no longer there. It is replaced by a corpse, a different substantial matter. Yet, this counter is difficult to assert in the light of the observation that the body is in fact the same body before and after death, as Scotus asserted. Furthermore, if the soul is the only substantial form which informs the body of how it should be, wouldn't the body simply dissipate into nothingness, or maybe prime matter, once the soul left? Yet it does not, it remains a corpse. Thus, there must be more than one substantial form for an individual substance. Specifically in this example, there is some form of the body, and some animating form, the soul. And the body will degrade over time without animation. As another topic of inquiry, I challenge you once again to outthink Scotus. For he attempted on this topic to argue for the hopeful truth that the soul can exist apart from the body, yet his attempts could not even persuade himself. Can any of you find some convincing argument that the soul is eternal? Scotus concluded that providing such is outside of our finite capabilities. While there are yet a couple of topics that Scotus an, uh, analyzes in his undertakings in metaphysics, they are truly part of a broader discussion that others have perhaps done a better job at illuminating. So instead of discussing those, I will return to the, the topic of univocity of being. In lay terms, univocity of being means that there is no distinction between a thing's existence or what it is and its being, or that it is. That is to say, that you cannot separate something being from what you can observe about it. This follows from the simple argument that we don't know what existence would be possible, what existence could possibly mean, I should say, outside of what we have some concept of what it actually exists. When we can understand things about a being, then we know that it exists. If we don't understand anything about its being, how can we know that it exists? This topic becomes particularly important when applied to the highest study of metaphysics, theology. Here we can elaborate that if we know something of the existence of one thing and something of the existence of another thing, then in the same way we know that both exist. In other words, there is only one sort of existence, hence univocity. The prime distinction that the univocity of being makes in theology is simply that the being of God 
is not substantially different from the being of man. This does not assert anything about God's being. We're not saying that he isn't perfect or infinite, but only that there is but a single type of being, you might say, being qua being. Existence is common to both man and God. A more theologically oriented perspective here would be to say that God created finite ex exten uh, existence as an extension of his own infinite existence. Both exist in the same way, except that our existence is finite, while his is infinite. Now consider this. In relation to my question on the soul before, perhaps we could make some argument concerning the infinite nature of the soul using this concept of the univocity of being, especially in relation to theology. And I think I will end with that question. Now, would any of you like to venture to counter Scotus on categories, or have any of you found a proof for the infinitude of the human soul? Let's hear it, and perhaps you may contribute to our understanding of being qua being. So that is all I have. And those questions remain. Maybe you could repeat those questions one more time, Jacob. But uh, before you do that, I'd like to acknowledge that I think that's, I think that's the best uh, monologue that you've ever produced so far, and it may be the best that the club has seen. Yeah. Very. Ooh, it's a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot there, but it's actually I really appreciate the style. And I appreciate uh, appreciate your method of asking questions. So I think that it was really nicely done. I appreciate the efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you guys. Um, hopefully, it wasn't uh, too uh, too packed. Um, so, but of course, I, I expect some conversation here. Perhaps we can. Uh, unpack the couple of topics so um, the first question had to do with how Scotus Scotus uh, categorizes things he says that there are 10 um, categories of, of well being uh, the first is the most real substances um, it's the material being and then all the others are accidental or you might say that they are attributes of substances. And if you, you can didn't, you list those off again? I, I, only I can. Got... Yeah. So it's quantity, quality, relation, action, passion, place, time, position, and finally state. Now, I think. And when I was writing this, one thing I considered was that it might be better if we were to analyze this in original language, because in English, place and position really do mean the same thing. Um, but that is part of what I wanted to talk about. What did he, what what were the distinctions there between place and position? Perhaps he meant, perhaps he meant some sort of class structure by position or something like that. I'm missing just one. There's substances. Quantity, quality, relation, action, passion, place, position, state, and one more. Number eight was time. Oh, time. Between place and position, yeah. So that so was the first, first question from that was, how did you word it? Uh, okay, so it was... Can you Let me... come up with a counter-argument yeah. for this? Something like that? Yeah, it was pretty much... How would you categorize these? Could you figure out something to add that is accidental? Or perhaps something that you could take away or combine? Yeah. Can you conceive of additional or combine the ones stated? I think I'm still missing one. Sure, I'll just read them again. Substances, quantity, quality, relation, action, passion, place, time, position, last, state. Got it. 
Now, my second question uh, is a little, a little more interesting, uh, more exploratory in nature. It Scotus spent some time trying and not quite succeeding in proving the eternal existence of the soul. So once the soul leaves the body, what happens to it? Now, of course, while he was an ordained minister, and he, he certainly believed that there was some sort of dwelling with God with your from your soul after death, uh, he couldn't quite find a logical proof for that in the same way that you know he, he sort of arrived and, and or even Aristotle arrived at at the metaphysics that we're discussing. It seemed, you know, it's all logical progression. But Scotus couldn't quite get there with the soul. So my question to you is, do you have an argument in the style of metaphysical arguments that would show or evidence the eternal existence of the soul? So just to clarify, he's not seeking to prove that the soul exists. He's seeking to prove the eternal existence of the soul. And that's a very interesting distinction. Um, he, in, in, in his mind, he proved that the soul exists by simply naming it as the animated um, primary form, substantial form of the body. So that's all the proof that he needed for that. He says, well, something must animate the flesh. Something must make man man beyond his empty corpse. I will call that the soul. But then, yes, mm -hmm. he is just asking, what happens to it after we die? Can I prove that it exists infinitely? Well, hmm. I want to stay within the framework of what you've said. Um, sorry, Jonathan, go on. I was just going to say, let me go back and finish the very end of your question. Uh, Jacob, do you have an argument in the style of a metaphysical argument for the infinite, what of the soul? Was it infinite soul? Eternal. Uh, eternal soul or infinite existence of the soul. It's the same okay. meaning. Okay. And if you wanted to simplify it, you could just say the existence of the soul separate from the body. Hmm. Because that's your starting, kind of your starting, that's a starting step to prove, you know, eternity. But Now, okay. I, the one other thing with the question, and I kind of, it was quick, so I want to go over it again. I actually suggested a starting point to the answer, um, and you don't have to use this. But what I said was, perhaps we could make some argument concerning the infinite nature of the soul using this concept of the univocative <laughs> being in relation to theology. And that concept, succinctly stated, said that the existence of God and the existence of man, you know, we exist in the same way. He just exists infinitely while we exist limitedly. So that's a potential starting point as well. Please go ahead and continue, Brandon. Okay. Uh, Jacob, please tell me if this needs to come at a later time in the discussion um but this seems to be something pertinent to the discussion that might be worth discussing and i hope that you're able to strike this down quickly because i would very much like it to be struck down quickly so if the soul is that which animates the human flesh and that is the proof of its existence do uh, animals creeping things fowls of the air fish of the sea have eternal souls mm -hmm. that animate their flesh yeah, so that is the the immediate response. Um, the The belief that Scotus arrives at is the same that that really Aristotle arrives at, and they pretty much say, well, they have some sort of ex you know animated existence, so they're attributing life to soul, and I don't think that that's particularly deviant from biblical understandings of life. God breathed the breath of life. Um, so I, I would just kind of say maybe, maybe animals do have, you know, souls in some way. Um, but that's not necessarily a personal belief, but in terms of metaphysics here, um, I don't think that they cared if animals had souls or not really. Hmm. Now someone might be able to correct me there. Someone might be able to have been a little bit better read. I don't think that when they said the word soul, they meant what a, uh, judeo-christian thinks when they say soul they literally define soul as the thing that animates a, 
a body. So if that's all a soul is, then an animal would have that. So it's like a limited definition of the word soul. It's not logos, for instance. It's not the logos of like a person. Hmm. So we don't endow the word soul with any definition, nor does Scotus than that which animates flesh. Apparently. Yeah. Human flesh. Why human? Because I thought uh, we were just saying, as Stephen summarized for us, that uh, the animating force for animals was not soul. Not in the Judeo-Christian sense. But in, in metaphysics, it's the same thing. Right. And they just don't quite care in metaphysics. So they yeah. don't necessarily take Genesis 2-7 as God bringing the breath of life into man and him becoming a living soul or living being as, um, as their starting point. Spirit. Yeah. It's hard for, I think, us in our worldview to strip that much, that much theology away. The word has a lot of meaning that we're accustomed to considering. Hmm. Are we going to attack one question then another? Or? I'll leave this open. I wanted to have a nice discussion. Can you go ahead and can you please reiterate the thing that you said just before Brandon made his last statement? Can you try to say that again? Because I think I heard you wrong or something. Which which thing are you asking about? Well, I thought that you just said that. Oh, how they define the soul? You said that, yeah, there was a Judeo-Christian what you call the Judeo-Christian definition of a soul, which only applied to mankind? Is that what you said? Um, well, what I, I said, I never actually to... defined the Judeo-Christian version of a soul. I'm saying that Dun Scotus's definition, which is like a purely metaphysical or logical definition, is quite different than the Judeo-Christian and more limited because all it is, all that the soul is to the Duns Scotus metaphysical thinking that we're discussing is that which animates a corpse, which is not what the average Judeo-Christian thinker would assume when they hear the word soul. So I didn't actually define what Judeo-Christians think when they hear the word soul. I'm just saying this is a smaller idea than that. Hmm. Does that make sense? I don't know why it's a small idea at all. I'll, I look at it actually kind of the opposite direction, but we're going to need a lot more definitions probably. I'm just thinking of something right now. I have... Um... Well, that's true. When I say it's a smaller... When I say it's a smaller idea... That's how much that, we've defined it. That's obviously portraying how I see the two things. Maybe less specific is a better way of saying smaller in this case, but but yeah less specific that could be that could work okay hmm. well nobody else has anything to add something that keeps popping into my mind that i feel someone would say so i kind of want to play a little bit of devil's advocate here if uh if the soul is what animates flesh then we have the boundary line here between the metaphysical and the physical we have something crossing, uh, something we can clearly see and sense with our five senses and something we cannot see and perceive with our five senses, or at least that's the way it seems to me. So the thing that would strike me is, okay, well, what do we know today about what animates a body? Electrical impulse? I mean, whenever somebody's dying on the table they put the uh the shock pads on their chest and they say clear and they fill them with electrical impulse so what is the soul but the electrical impulse is filling a body which means is it really even a metaphysical reality mm -hmm. and we even claim that yeah that's Isn't great purely a physical reality yeah so you're saying it's a physical re it's basically an electromagnetic yeah. Property of the body. Again, 
I'm saying that to kind of play devil's advocate here because I think that ultimately our definition of the soul is too specific right now and not inclusive enough um, for things that might might help us get past the pure rational rationality that I just presented, which yeah. we can't. You know. I'm glad you brought both of these things up because those are the two obvious counters to to this lecture um, from the modern man's perspective, right? Yeah. So this one is the second this, this question you've just brought up. Um, I don't have a good answer for right now, except to say that I believe Scotus and Aristotle, if per, if presented the scientific explanations of how bodies work. Um, that we now have access to in the modern day, I believe that they would have reformed greatly their definition of soul, and they would have come up with something different. So at this point, it's tasked to us to a do clear so. clear and open slate. Yep. Which is exciting, but also very daunting. Okay, can you go ahead and expound on that a little bit, Jacob? Um, exactly why you would think that they would redefine soul because you think that a definition of an animating force as say electrical impulse is inadequate or you think it's too materialistic and not no. metaphysical or i'm saying electro i'm saying the thing that makes the body animated is in fact also uh the body I'm saying so in in Scotus just in that example I gave where there was two substantial forms which constitute the body one was the animating force i.e. the soul and the other was the body i.e. the flesh in our modern scientific understanding of the body the body in fact does animate itself there's blood there is the heart there's electrical current um, via the heart there's all these muscle impulses there's the brain controlling it all through so much complica complicated thing that maybe we don't understand very well still but at least we have a slightly better grasp than those in the 1500s or, you know, 500 BC uh, did. So I think given the scientists that they were, or at least the appreciators of science that they both were, that if you would, show, would have given them the knowledge that we have now, then they would have reverted to saying the soul is something else then. And that's kind of the question that we first arrive at when investigating the question of um, is the soul eternal? We kind of have to define what the soul is, uh, given that their definition is inadequate. Yeah, so let me go ahead and try to expand this a little bit, and we'll see if we'll start to move somewhere. I suppose I took for granted that we were going to say that the animating force in the body was non-material. And so that's why, and the reason I say that is because I would have taken for granted that the idea of electrical impulse would be excluded because that's already inside of the body. I can, I, can, I can jump on that boat because medically, even in the modern day, we have these instances where a body is technically still living, but we have, we have a, a dead person. We have a person in a vegetative state or a brain dead individual or whatever, where the field, the magnetic field, is still operating but the thing that animates the body is gone and it's not physical at all somehow and that's something modern science still is completely baffled by so the electrical impulse is still active in the brain is what you're saying there are even people whose brains are still active yet they're in a vegetative state their person is no longer there and you know they attribute that to damages or whatever but it's still not explainable yeah by science so hmm. to clarify here we could perhaps, based on our own observations, and, and I'll give my own here in a moment, still assert that the soul is the animating force while expanding our understanding of the body as we have in the modern day. Um, if any of you have been around someone as they are dying, if they die in a, a coma state, you understand that they're not there in a real way um and it's it's very questionable can they hear you can they feel 
What's around them? What's going on? Are they in this deep sleep? Um, and, and you can do some scientific analysis of that, you know, blood oxygen levels and things like that to determine how deep of a sleep they're in. But um, I think what, what Stevens pointed out here is that they don't have an animated force anymore um, if, once they've gotten past a certain state. The, the two people I've been around when they were dying both did the same, uh, went through the same process. They breathed slower and slower and slower until, um, until they breathed their last. Like the, the euphemism is really quite true. Um, and while you could still detect some movement of the heart, of the blood, while you could still do, uh, I believe it's a MRI of the brain and still detect some activity going on, even after their technical last breath, it's very evident to those around them that their animating force is gone. The soul has departed and the body shuts down eventually is the postulate. I like that explanation to kind of counter the, the devil's advocacy that Brandon brought up there. So um, I would kind of motion if there was no objection that we can take that as true and perhaps move back to the main question. Good stuff. I think well, the were... reason I <laughs> thought of that in that way was I was trying to think about dreams. Mm. Because dreams are an experience for the person that they re they relate the dream to you, the person relates a dream to you that he claims he had and whatnot. Um, but unless you want to, excluding some kind of situation such as sleepwalking, uh, dreams do not cause bodily movement. Animation. But maybe they cause bodily activity, if you want to talk about the electrical movement in, in the brain during sleep, which I believe we, we know that's real. So that's observable. You can see with a scanner that there's electrical impulse in the, in the brain. Um, but is that animating the body? I don't know exactly because the body, I mean, well, technically what there's rapid eye movement. So that's actually a form of movement on the body. But I would have first started down the line of thinking that a dream is something that occurs to the soul of a person and not to the body. Oh, I see what you're saying. Is that reasonable? Hmm. And then I guess if you went, so if you can prove that the soul can have experiences that the body is not experiencing, then that's lending credence to the other nature of the soul like it could continue having experiences without a body i guess well i'm just i'm just really thinking that the soul is immaterial i really took that as an assumption that the soul was immaterial and so to me the idea of talk about you know electrical impulse in the brain is is kind of meaningless because i don't care about that because that's still happening inside of the body you know, to me, it, it, how can you necessarily, how are you going to make the distinction between the quote unquote natural electrical activity in the body that would happen between, you know, a normal person anywhere, whatnot, and an electrocuted inmate on death row? The only difference is a matter of amplitude, is a matter of quantity. Is that right? <laughs> but the person is dead. I mean, we certainly hope the person is dead. The person should be dead by the end of that operation. <laughs> so the electricity, the electricity is still there. <laughs> it's only a matter of, of, of quantity, right? So are we going to say that soul is the normal range of electrical activity that a, that a body can just produce on its own? You know, my heart's going to beat this. I'm going to have my amperage in this way. 
So I don't think so. that's certainly that's certainly all at the present time that I believe we can rationally observe and make an empirical judgment about. I, I don't think that I don't think that makes sense. Really good sense. You no, know? I, I don't think of it making very good sense because you know if the soul is just this normal range of the electrical activity, and then you blow past that healthy range. Have you desold the person? I, I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say there. So, I I don't take as meaningful the idea that the animating force is electrical current. I don't and, think that makes any sense. And that's that's this actually we we're in agreement here. That's the same thing Stephen said and that I elaborated on, um, although yep. not quite. Yeah. So. So graphically, right? But we that was agree. <laughs> What's that? We agree. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think so. Well, That's so, a good counter, yeah. Agree. I also good. agree. I just find trouble improving that from a modern perspective. You find trouble with what exactly? Improving what from a modern perspective? The existence of the soul. I mean, I, I think it's definitely logically provable. That's one of the great things about logic, but I, I don't see a way using this scientific method founded by Bacon to do an experiment and make something known and brought into the light of day through scientific exploration, which is the current belief of the day. I mean, I'm just sitting here and I'm thinking of what Sam Harris would say. And I just, I hear him scoffing at all of this and saying, well, okay, Maybe it's not the electrical current. Maybe I can't prove that, but you most certainly can't prove to me through experimentation, through science, what else it might be. Maybe we have some questions that science has not answered yet and electrical current is not the entire answer, but it's no more false than the idea that there's this, uh, this inner ghost animating a corpse uh you cut out there brandon can you repeat that sure it's, it's this idea that there's an inner ghost animating a corpse maybe we haven't answered all the questions about electric currents but it seems like the most probable answer from a point of view of rationality even if it is this idea that you know you've desold a person past a certain quantity uh well i just want to point out that metaphysics does not is not a scientific endeavor it's it's primarily formed on tenets of logic um yeah and, you know we're studying being qual being as, as i've said so in this case um you're going to have a much harder time proving the existence of the soul and or the existence of the you know eternal soul or soul without body um using science so uh and also you know that's just not the question right now so yeah, yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah, I'm just... I would agree with that, absolutely. It, it's not the question. And if you Lending start trying to science, thought, it, all... it doesn't work, right? It, it just doesn't work. Um, because two things I've been thinking recently about science. Um, I've, I've run across, I think, this year, or maybe at the end of last year, some people who were just putting forward the point of view that there is no such thing as the scientific method. Uh, it was just a catchphrase. I didn't pursue it and I don't have time to necessarily pursue it and I'm not going to, I don't remember who it was necessarily, I don't want to go back and find it. Um, it. It would be interesting to look at sometime in the future, but right now in the short term, it's not in my point of view. But, you know, as much as you want to say there's a scientific method or there's not a scientific method, there's two things that I think of that really should apply if you want to do quote unquote real rigorous science, right? There's going to be two things. The first thing is that you want reproducibility, right? You want an experiment to be reproduced and want to find a similar or almost identical type of data spread or suggested answers, things like that. We can't do that with a corpse because we cannot reanimate the corpse. Uh, human beings, we don't have a way to necessarily do that. So we're not going to be able to run a scientific experiment on that because we just don't have a way to de-soul you, maybe by electrical impulse or whatnot, 
and then put the soul back in. So all the experiments are going to go one direction, right? It's a termination. It's a termination. It's a termination every time. And so um, a good chance getting that past the ethics committee to start with. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyhow, that's the first thing to think about. That's the first objection to a scientific idea of a study on that. The second thing that I keep thinking about is that science as a tool, because remember, it's a tool. It's not an ideology. It's not. It's a tool for, for discovering natural laws and, and such not, right? Yeah. Science is not a tool to find. No. How would I say this? And I, I'm working out the right way to say this, but I think the way to say this is science is not a tool to verify anything. Maybe science, if you do really good science, you're not verifying anything. What you really can do with science is falsify things. Uh, science is used as a process of elimination. Okay. And all of the world said, oof. That's what I've been thinking of. And this is, you know, if I can get, get around to it, I'm going to maybe start writing on it and maybe get some kind of essay. Well, I apologize if I drove us too far afield, but I just wanted to bring that up because it seemed sure. pertinent. So sure. yeah, but logical proofs, I, I think it's certainly viable. Um, I don't feel qualified in the slightest to offer a logical proof. I am not the most logical person I know, so. I, I'm uh, not either. And so of course, uh, my, my training in logic is not very extensive at all. And so I'm not necessarily good with that, but it is good to make the distinction that um, Logic and science often work together, but there are places that logic can go and be applied where science cannot. Yeah. And this that's is a, that's a really interesting statement. I, I really like that statement. I don't think that there are many people in our day and age that would readily admit that. Like, but it's, it makes sense. It's a humble thing to say from, from a rational point of view. The thing I was I kept asking here is that I'm trying to understand if we have a meaningful difference or not between two terms as we're using them in, in this conversation and, and asking questions about this. Are we saying that there's any difference or are we just using them interchangeably? The terms soul and essence. Hmm. Have we used the term essence? We have not. I don't think anyone has necessarily used the term essence yet. I don't believe it was in your monologue, um, but it, it was just a word that popped up to me. And then I actually looked in my dictionary to try to look at the definition of soul. And essence was mentioned in there. I can read it if anyone is interested, but I'm just curious if this is important or if anyone has distinguished I, something, a difference between these two terms. I can clarify. Uh, I think essence is somewhat akin to a substantial form or maybe any form, but probably a substantial form or an accidental form. And um, yeah, soul is a particular substantial form. So the you essence really of um, a human's, a human being animated is the soul. I mean, that's also a true statement. So the substantial form of an animated human or the animation of a human is all, is the soul. But I, I think essence is a bit of a redundant term in this case. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it wasn't necessarily important to some point. I wasn't going to use it to build off of or start to make an argument necessarily from these two terms or something like that. I was just curious if anyone was trying to work out that we're using these two terms differently. No, I had not considered essence in particular. Okay. I do think, y'all can say whether or not this is something y'all even want to talk about, but I do think that we can say it's a human soul we're talking about. And I think I can logically support that. I'm okay with that, just limiting the scope. Okay, I think it's a human soul because 
of an argument that I've heard before about the um, difference, if you will, between other forms of life and the human form of life. And you can actually take it further. You can even take it away from life. There's this idea that in existence, stimulus and response is a constant cycle. Um, for instance, one asteroid hitting another asteroid, it's, there's a stimulus and a response that can easily be observed, quantified, calculated. Um, so that's obviously very much not alive, but it's a stimulus and a response. Then you could take it further. You could say the sun light only hits this side of the plant so the plant turns towards the sunlight it, there's a stimulus the sun and there's a response from the planet it turns or a venus flytrap if you touch a venus flytrap it closes there's a stimulus and a response but you can keep going with that and call almost all forms of life just machines that respond to stimulus whether that stimulus is hunger or exhaustion or thirst or uh, hormonal desire it's just stimulus response machines. And the reason you can say that is because nothing in existence plays the guitar except for a human or says, I love you, except for a human or says, I hate you, except for a human, because those things don't make any sense in this universe of stimulus response. Mm. What kind of stimulus in the world could lead to the response of playing the guitar? Like it doesn't make sense. Uh, and that's one way I think we can support our focus of saying we're talking about human um, animators because that which animates a human appears to animate differently than anything else in the universe that we've ever seen. So we're talking about a different kind of animation, not not a not as mundane as whatever animates an asteroid or a plant or a tiger. Different kind of animation. Hmm. I like that. Well, I would I'd just ask quickly, why do we think that asteroids are animated? Well, if you're using only the word animated, and then you see like an asteroid hit another asteroid, and then the trajectories of both are changed, there's animation there, right? There's locomotion. I don't think so. I don't think so. And the reason, I mean, I, I think we're starting to get into a circle of terms here, and uh, I don't know if it's really going to be helpful, but... The reason I particularly ask this is because this is what the word animated means. And so it's starting to get a little tautological, but uh, an, um, anim animate. All right, so for example, the verb animate means to give spirit and support to, encourage. Number two, it means to give life to. Number three, it means to move in, to move to action. But anima, from Latin, as I remember, it basically it, just, it has to do with spirit. So I don't know that necessarily like asteroids have spirits. Hmm. We're I talking, think... Sorry, we're go on. Ask if maybe animals have spirits. We don't know. We may or may not go there in this conversation. Um, but that's why I was trying to ask about essence. Um, well. If I may make a statement, mm -hmm. um, the way Stephen's statement falls on my ears is that we simply can say the soul is not merely stimulus response. The human soul is not merely stimulus response. Mm -hmm. so forget the word animate. We can say that if an asteroid responds to an outside stimulus a certain way, mm -hmm. um, or an animal responds to the desire to procreate, in a certain way, and whenever that desire possesses them, it is a primal urge that they must say yes to or die. A human can say no to that urge. So there seems to be something different at the very least, which would make me believe that there is something more going on in the human than stimulus response. So we've taken electromagnetic impulse off the table. We've okay. taken stimulus response off the table. Okay. That's the I way see. I see. So, Stephen, if any of that's wrong, please let me know. I think that's that's fairly good. And I thought of a funny illustration while you were talking too. I was like, you could punch an asteroid 
and then calculate exactly the reaction of that asteroid. But if you punch a person, you will not be able to calculate the reaction of that person with exact <laughs> like, mm. certainty, uh, which is also illustrating the same point. The counter argument is evident there as well, though, is uh, punching a person and not knowing what they're going to do is perhaps an issue of lack of knowledge, not an issue of... Um, Something deeper than that. Yeah, but that, that, that infers it's calculable. Right. And but, I would go back to the guitar, exactly. Like, what stimulus could possibly well, lead to someone playing guitar? That's That seems incalculable as well. Yeah, it's perhaps. But I... I, I I mean I know a lot about music. I, I think considering writing a music theory article soon, but um, which would explain part of why, from a scientific level, from a brain level, uh, you might want to play an instrument. But I I think perhaps we could get to the same point in a much easier route, um, just simply by saying the soul of one thing is different from the soul of another thing. And even more specifically, uh, that my soul is different from your soul. And this is something that, you know, Scotus and Aristotle both were very happy to say, and, and it's a topic that I actually didn't include. It's one of the ones I mentioned uh, was better addressed elsewhere. Um, so I won't go in too far into it right now, but um, what we're investigating is human souls. And while mm. there are perhaps other souls, we can just easily say, well, human souls are different from other souls um, without having to define those differences unless it helps in, in exploring our question uh, and, and move forward with the question of, is the human soul eternal? Hmm. So I think that Jonathan's idea of essence and soul needing to be delineated pretty uh, pertinent to the discussion. Uh, and I feel like he hasn't quite gotten a chance to unpack that. I don't and necessarily I have anything like to do with that. that. I don't know. That seems important to me. I don't know. It might not be. But I can just tell you the first thing that comes into my head. I mean, I can read definitions out of the dictionary and, and look at some of the etymology, which I always think is good for me. But the reason I just kind of thought of these two terms as synonyms that we're going to use right here, um, to me, they're synonyms as they refer to human beings. And so I would think that your essence as a human being is a thing that animates you. Um, I don't think of an asteroid as being animated, but I think that it has an essence. Uh, but the reason that I thought of this was I was thinking about Aristotle's uh, four causes. And I was trying to think about um, how that necessarily applied to this discussion. And I haven't really flushed that out and, and fleshed that out rather and, um, and expounded on that per se. But I'm just kind of taking as as my starting point that essence and soul are the same thing as we're talking about human beings and that it's immaterial, as I've already said, and I've explained why I think it's immaterial. I like that you bring up the four causes. I had a thought earlier that I forgot until you said that the uh, nine categories described one of the things I thought when I heard them for the first time was you need all of those words in order to work through the four causes of any given thing. Well, or you probably need most of them, if not all of them, just to work through the four causes. Because I've been thinking a lot about working through the four causes because I'm going to use them to analyze social media. And I'm in the process of figuring that out. Um, but yeah, all of these words, you pretty much need them in order to work through those four causes because it's so thorough that's a good point on the question of these categories and their imminence 
Yeah, I don't per se have a lot to think on with the second question. I'm actually much more interested in the first question right now. Um, and I guess the first thing I would think about, uh, just proposing as kind of a simple yes or no question, is can we combine passion into or passion under action? What does passion mean and why should it be distinct? Hmm. Distinct from action. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. You know, this is actually perhaps the most pertinent relation, uh, hmm, distinction, relational topic between the two questions. Of all the things that could happen just now, um, I think perhaps passion is the accident in relation to human substance that has to do with the soul. my first like gut instinct is to say something like well i eat dinner every day it's an action that i do because i have to but on special days i eat mac and cheese because i love it <laughs> <laughs> i have passion for the mac and cheese but um <laughs> I don't really have passion for dinner, that particular action, but I have this passion for another action, eating mac and cheese. That's my like gut instinct response, literally. I feel like we need to laugh at the pun in order to validate it. Which pun? <laughs> you don't have to. I didn't get it. No, I'm, I'm focused on something else. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to write down because this is my uh, critical thinking question. And Jacob has already responded saying, oh, that's actually kind of valuable. So I'm just trying to write it down here. Um, but if you want to expound on that a little bit, Stephen, what makes the difference to you between eating dinner and passionately eating the food that you want? Well, it probably has something to do with enjoyment. I don't always enjoy dinner. <laughs> um, and that's not really a critique of anything. I always enjoy dinner. I don't always enjoy dinner, especially if I'm on a diet or something. I'm not necessarily going to enjoy dinner. Um, but I really enjoy mac and cheese, even if I'm like sick and not hungry. Like, I'm going to enjoy the mac and cheese. So that's one of the reasons I think I'm passionate about it. Just had a thought come into my mind. This is just going to, yet again, demonstrate the illogical quality of my being. There's a poem called The Passionate Shepherd to His Love. Uh, where he talks about picking her flowers and weaving her a garland and playing for her on his flute. And, you know, from the material perspective, you just say, oh, observe the mating ritual of the evolved primate in his... Uh... But still, there's something about the poem that shows that there's something inherently passionate about what he's doing um, besides the biological evolutionary urge to procreate with her. There's something more going on there. Uh, he seems to be desiring only her. No other love would suit his desire. Um, it's a miracle that an animal can be monogamous if, in fact, humans are animals. Um, well, again, um, it's I'm probably going far afield again. I apologize. That's why I'm like, I, no, I, I don't want to interrupt. If you have more, then you please go ahead. I don't. I don't. Uh, I really don't. The funny thing is, it's 
we keep coming back to these terms and we can't get away from them because as I was just looking in the dictionary, the modern word animal comes from the Latin root anima, which mm. means soul. So it just, we keep getting tangled in this thing. Ugh. We don't know if the humans have the souls only, if the animals only have the souls. I still really don't want to touch this per se, um, but it is a funny little etymological note, footnote, onto your question of, well, are, if humans are indeed animals. Well, how literal do you want to be with these words based on their where they come from versus how they're used. It's a tricky thing. Yeah, it's a minefield. That's why I'm I have tossed this 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 ball into y'all's court. <laughs> I'm treating it more like a cherry bomb, just to let everybody else know. Man. <laughs> These really questions are scaring people off. Yeah. I think when you all is booby traps, I I don't really want. I just I don't know. I'm just not interested in talking about animals today per se. But I am interested in this question about the passion and the action, and uh, so I'm just trying to kind of, as I said, flesh out an idea of, of how to look at all of these specifically the nine things. Jacob, could you just expound at all a little bit on why you called these nine categories after substance? accidental or what that means in the context of what they're talking about it was directly from um scott's writing and of course aristotle used the term accident in a very similar way um the so the differentiation again is substances are the actual material thing and then all of these other things are qualities or attributes well quality is one of them um, they're attributes or things that are, they, they exist, but almost accidentally. It's not like they're the, they're the, the, the cause, right? Substance matter is the prime thing. And then all these other things kind of exist. Sure. Maybe modifiers. Yeah. Is a good word, maybe. It's hard because again, it's, it's a translation, um, issue here for accident but accident is the word that i think we've just always used um from you know the ancient greek that aristotle used for you know to right. describe this phenomenon but yeah modifiers attributes um all of the, those are those are also good definitions good good alternative words than accident although i think accident has a little bit of a deeper meaning in context i didn't quite get into that context in the analysis sure. and mm -hmm. so Another important thing I was considering, uh, especially for passion, was that we have to consider here that substances are not simply animals. Substances can be inanimate uh, objects. So uh, I would assert a couple things up front uh, that not all nine of these accidental uh, things being um, necessarily have to exist in each substance. So that's an interesting Side point, it is perhaps true that passion only exists in humans or something along those lines. Yeah, that's kind of, I think, what I was, without realizing it, trying to get at and what I said earlier, in which kind of speaks to what Jonathan was saying, passion going under action and being combined into the same category. Because we know that both humans and animals can do actions so if an animal and a human can do an action, then does that also mean that both animals and humans have passion? And one know. other thing, this also goes back to my comment on passion being uh, related to the uh, substantial form of, of the soul rather than the substantial form of the body. Mm -hmm. If only humans have passion, which is just kind of a guess, um, then it would it would also argue for the difference of a human soul. Passion is really hard, actually. Um, passion is really hard. Like, I was just trying to come up with a silly example, but something that illustrates the point. Say you have a pile of rocks, um, quantity, 20 rocks 
quality. They're made of pure granite. Passion, we're just going to skip that. Relation, they come from a granite mine a mile away. Uh, action, they're swaying because they're being blown around in the wind. Position, they're stacked in like a, a pyramid. Place, they're on a hill in Scotland. Uh, time, this is the day. Uh, state, I don't know, state. So passion and state are the ones that I struggle with in this random illustration. But I feel like there could be a lot of random illustrations where you would not be able to apply various ones. Okay. The question, I guess my first question is, it's a, it's a good observation from Jacob, going back to what Jacob said, that not necessarily all of these nine accidental categories are applicable to what I'm just calling objects right now. Uh, it's a good observation. But also, if you want to play devil's advocate here, how is it not a cop out? Okay, it, it's, it's a tricky thing, right? Now you have to start dis describing essence of things. And what if someone comes in and says, okay, well, you've described all 10 of these categories. Can I apply all 10 of these categories to say granite rocks? And you say, well, no, actually, you can only apply about eight of them. Okay, well, that doesn't seem fair. All right, let's try something else. Can I apply all 10 of these categories to manatees? Well, no, there's a couple of categories here that don't, okay. So it's, it's an interesting thing. I'm, it's, it's like a kind of a yardstick to start to sort these objects into different ways. And you have to understand that not all of the categories apply to all of these objects. So, so it's more like a master list. You see what I'm saying? It's like the yeah. master total sum list of all the different rules, quote unquote, or categorical rules that we're using. And, and you have to learn, you have to be wise enough to understand that sometimes they apply to the object, and sometimes they don't. So I think that's an important kind of advanced uh, deduction to understand, as, as Jacob mentioned. Hmm. If I may elaborate a bit on that, um, what I meant when I said that not all nine accidental forms apply to each uh, substance is simply that some of these accidental forms might be something along the lines of null or unclear. Um, the nine things are all observable, and that's an important thing to, to consider when discussing sub Well, all ten are observable. You know, substance is material. And then each of these ten, uh, or each of these additional nine things should be things that we can perhaps observe. But to say that... Um, let's say passion is null in a, in a pile of rocks, is simply to say that we cannot observe a passion in this pile of rocks. And I don't see that as a cop-out. I see that as simply, you know, a, a, a quality of some things that are in the world. It's, hmm. it's unobservable. Huh. Right. And so the reason that I, I'm not trying to necessarily walk along the fence or, or tip one side or the other. I, I agree that it's true, that it's not a cop-out necessarily. Um, but the immediate response that I think of is, okay, it is very reasonable to say that the attribute of a category, the value of that attribute, um, the, the, the value of that ad attribute in categorizing something is null or unknown. Because really, if you work with like advanced, not even advanced math, if you work with just some kind of mid-level math or lots of things, you start to understand there are things that are just the values are unknown, right? So that's very reasonable. But my quick question would be, okay, if we're going to have potential null values on these attributes, why do we stop with 10? Or in other words, why do we have nine specific accidental categories and why don't we add more or at what point do we decide to stop 
having ways of categorizing these that's objects. That's the question. And that's a really big question. Can you add more? That was the question. <laughs> no. You are on point today, Jonathan. <laughs> Man. I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. This you is people are going to ditch out on this meeting. Come on. Offer. <laughs> <laughs> I was wow. feeling bad about my roundup Saturday, okay? Uh, <laughs> anyway, but the reason to go all the way back to Stephen's first example, he's trying to distinguish between a dinner that he is not passionate about and then a specific meal, we're going to say a dinner, that he does get passionate about. And so I was thinking, okay, that sounds, sounds kind of like it'll continue. Yeah, that sounds like a... a a following point. So then I started to try to think, okay, well, if we take these nine accidental down below substance, and I still have a, I still am trying to understand if substance stands by itself, or is substance the expression of essence, or is substance the same as essence, but we'll get to that, I guess, some other time. If we take these nine accidental down below, right, I'm trying to see if we could take kind of like a mirror and shine them back on each other and see if this, if they all sort of, I guess for lack of a better term, if they connect to each other, right? So the thing that I'm thinking about with Stephen is, Stephen's going to try to say, all right, I have a different passion for dinner versus a macaroni and cheese. I'm thinking of that as a quantity which is one of the categories. It's a quantity of what we're calling passion. In fact, you could even say that is a quantity of a quality. Mm. Is it high passion or low passion? Ooh. Oof. Normal dinner for Steven is low passion. One specific dinner is high passion. So I still don't have an example of why or where we need passion as a category distinct from these other things. Um, I, I want to bring this back on, on track. Um, the nine categories only apply to material substances. So be careful. Uh, you will get into a, a, a twisty maze if you start trying to apply attributes to other attributes. This is to apply a non- material thing to another non-material thing. In this case, what, what a more precise and what, what these metaphysical thinkers have determined is a more accurate uh, definition of a thing being is that there is a material substance and then there's a list of attributes associated with that substance. When you apply attributes to attributes, what you really are doing or perhaps what you should do is apply attributes to the material substance of the attributes that you're applying the attributes to. Can you repeat that one time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could. Um, do you really want me to? Or... Yeah, I'd like you to do it one more time slowly, please. <laughs> what should we really be doing? When you apply attributes, <laughs> I can't believe you're making me say this again. <laughs> to other attributes, I would like you to what you, say it again. I what you should be doing you. is applying those attributes to the material substance that you're applying the attributes that, <laughs> <dang it. laughs> that you're applying it to. It's quite confusing. Sixty percent of the way there. Yeah. No, that, that's that's understandable. Yeah. You're, you're basically Apple's saying a decision tree, right? You're basically saying let's use a decision tree. So, for example, on Stevens, I'm going to go to Stevens' other example of the granite rocks or boulders or whatever they are. If we say that there's a quantity of 20, we can do a decision tree after we have this quantity and we can make other accidental attributes on this 20. Is that what you're trying to say as an example, Jacob? Yeah. I've thought of it, I've conceived of this in another way. Um, the way we describe each of the nine accidents can be as complicated or as simple as we'd like to. True. That's another way to say this. I think that's, that's 
again, that's another good point. You, you continue to make good points on this. It can be as complicated as simple, and we're keeping complicated and simple sort of undefined. But your first point was that not all necessarily apply. Your second is that um, how it applies can be as complicated or simple as we want. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's fair. There was an intermediate point to just to say that it, it's it's not sensical in a metaphysical uh, structure to apply accidental forms to accidental forms. Accidental forms are by nature, and this goes back to what I was saying about the using the word accidental, um, accidents or attributes of material substances. So they would only have meaning if they are applied to a material substance. Yes. What yes. you would get if you... From Scotus if... and Aristotle both, yeah. you can find, they, they explore this in slightly different ways, but they, you will find where they say, well, accidents of accidents is nonsensical. Accidents of accidents is nonsensical. Is that right? Okay. But I still have a lot of respect for what you're like, what you seem to be gunning for here, Jonathan. Like, there needs to be something about passion that is unique enough to convince us that passion is unique. <laughs> like it's not just a conglomeration of other things. Passion needs to be passion by itself. And I, I appreciate that. The thing that, that came up to me is I'm trying to understand how passion can be expressed. And I, I'm really trying to move away from using the passive voice, definitely in writing. I don't need to use it in speaking. How do you express passion? How can you imagine that something would express passion without action? Yeah. It's... So, but that means that passion, in order to be passion, would have to be expressed. But why are we so certain that passion has to be expressed in order to be passion? Okay. If you, okay, say that again. Like a feeling. Why are we so sure that passion I mean. needs to be expressed? You have to express a feeling, right? You don't have to express a feeling in order to feel a feeling. So. Okay, true, but that why, is. Why do we have to express passion in order for passion to be present? Because I'm taking the third person perspective on this. Inside of your own being or inside of your own mind, you know your emotions. Or your feelings, as you as you call them. Yeah, you know your feelings inside. Stephen does, but I, on the outside, I do not know those feelings until you express them. Maybe you will tell me about them. Maybe you will act them out. Maybe they will influence you, your your action or your inaction, so much that I can observe them. Okay. What about my granite rocks, though? They're from a quarry a mile down the road, but. You may not know that. I know that. You may not know that when you look at my pile of rocks. So then you would assume they have no relationship. But I would know they have a relationship to the quarry a mile down the road. So you would okay. say have no relationship. In that case, in that case, your what I'm going to call an attribute table because this is what I've called it. This is what this is called in um, in the type of mapping work that I've done. It's it's called an attribute table. I think it applies here. Your attribute table on these rocks will be more complete than my attribute table because I have less information, mm -hmm. which is what Jacob has already mentioned, that there's definitely a chance on this attribute table. If we want to think of it as a table, I think it's, it's helpful for me. There's a chance that there will be no value, a null value, an unknown value, something like that. Okay, so that, that makes sense. That makes sense. And as you go down and use these nine accidental attributes to define or to write about these rocks, you have more information than I do, right? Because you happen to know that there is a, a relation. I'm sorry, did you ask a question? Because I just cut out for like 10 seconds. Yeah, I saw that. No, I'm saying that your attribute table is more complete than mine. Okay, yeah. Because you have more information, right? 
Uh-huh. So that's fair. I think that still holds within the rules of this decision making and categorizing system that we have. No problem. What I'm saying is how can you observe passion without it being expressed? Simply because it's only observable to the substance itself, in this case, the human who has the passion, does not alter its its truthfulness, its existence, yeah. its being. Uh, so I would say that, yes, perhaps the... Well, I would say that the difficulty perhaps here is coming in in maybe something I mentioned, which was that these are observable attributes. Um, that's mm-hmm. not explicitly saying that they're observable from outside observers. If it's only observable within the being, in this case, passion, um, in, in the most true observables, in the most true meaning of observe, um, that's not to say that it doesn't exist. Now, the outside person okay. might be able to deduce right. that there's passions, but... Why did you change the word, though? Because you were saying action before, but just now you said expressed. Because to me... To express something is to do an action of it. To make an action of it is to act with it. What about doing nothing? Is doing nothing considered an action? Yes. The action of nullity. The action of inaction. So there's always an action for everything always because it is either doing something or nothing. Sure. Let's say that. Yeah, let's say that. So what does that have anything to do with like the validity of passion? I'm saying how can you see or observe passion if the action level is zero? I think I've answered that right, just to clarify. And, and so Jacob says it could be basically be all internal, right? Yeah. So I'm That's saying, cool. okay, all right, so let's so let's just stop for a minute and, and let's go backward. Okay. I'll give Jacob that point. That's fine. But now what we have done is we have taken a set of nine categories and we've divided them into two categories of categorize. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a set of right now, eight categories, which are observable categories. And right now we have one in the unobservable category. So in the eight side, we have things like quantity, quality, et cetera, et cetera. And on the unobservable side, we have passion because we have said, as Jacob has just said, that passion can be inert inside of this object. And we may not be able to decide a value for it. If it's high, low, going around in circles, who knows? This is very important. Inside of this object. But the other eight right now, we can observe them in some way, at least so far. Maybe we'll start... Dividing, but we've already divided this whole list of categories into two categories, observed and unobserved. I don't and think so that's my true. Question, what? I don't think, that, I don't think that's even like remotely true. Okay, and give me a counterexample. If we don't know the quantity of something, right? If we don't know, if we can't know the quantity of something, for instance, I don't know, the, the stars in the universe, we don't know okay. the quantity of it. It's an unknowable thing. Right, okay. just like the passion that's held within only the mind of a person, um, then they're the same because you have quantity that can be known or unknown. And for instance, with passion, the way you said it a second ago makes it to where passion, as we defined it, or as you just defined it, can only be the passion that's not observable. Everything that's observable is no longer passion. Right, like because that's that's the no, way I didn't say everything that. gets observed. I didn't say that. Not passion. I didn't think that. You you expounded off to that. Maybe I, I should clarify. I should clarify. I guess maybe we shouldn't have two categories. Maybe that's too distinct. Maybe they should be Venn diagrams. Okay. Ah, and yes. passion passion can sit either in the observable or the non-observable, the unobservable. Mm-hmm. Passion can go either way. So, for example, on a person, I can note your passion from the outside, or I may not be able to get a value on your passion. 
you come up with another example, Stephen, where you're saying that a material things like stars, those are observable, and yet we can't really count them. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't get the quantity. So everything, okay. all of these nine accidents may be in one side of the Venn diagram, or they may be in the other side. Yeah, and it works for others, like relationships, for instance. Say you got two people sitting on a bench, and they're not looking at each other and talking to each other. You can't really know if they have a relationship or not just by looking at them. They may be best friends, or they may have never seen each other before. They're sitting on a bench next to each other. They may or may not have a relationship, and it's unknowable until you start probing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we're, this we're is, kind of back. We're back where we started. We're back. Can I say we... something? May I say something? Sure. I apologize. Uh, this may be far afield, and if it is, then just go past it. At least we know that there must be some quantity of the stars. We can't tell the exact quantity, but we know that there must be some quantity. Therefore, quantity exists and is definable. I think what Jonathan is saying is that passion it doesn't seem to be readily apparent that it can fit in this, this material framework at all. I'm saying that it can't observable material framework unless it's expressed with action, which, which to me is significant is significant because this goes back to Jacob idea about the soul. Um, and I don't feel, again, I do not feel qualified to take it past this. I feel like there's an existential horizon that i'm beating up against here but passion seems to be that thing that denotes to me uh that there is an anima in the human that that, that, that is different because we are we are aware of ourselves that you know that word in transcendence the movie you're, you're self-aware you become mm -hmm. self-aware to the point that you begin to contemplate existence uh, and you can prove to yourself, at least, that you are passionate, that you have some sort of passion. And whether one of what passion is still, what is it? I mean, it's this, it's this fog in the air. We can't really even seem to define that. But maybe it's not important to define its existence to other people. To the third person perspective, I think, is mm -hmm. what you said. Maybe. I don't know. So that's just my two cents. No, there, there's there's good points in there. I suppose what I'm saying is we should slow down and, and back up and go back. Okay, because this is something Brandon just just spoke about. I'm calling this an attribute table. You can think of it as like as an Excel sheet or a cell sheet or something like this, right? So I'm considering it like that. I'm considering it like a sheet with a bunch of cells. And we go to the first one and we say substance. And I'm going to go very simply here, just to keep it simple. I don't know if we can expand beyond this. But we're going to go very simple. The possible inputs for substance is binary. On, off. Yes or no. We're going to say yes. Okay. So substance is met. Yes. So now we have nine subcategories. Nine accidental categories underneath it. Right? Now, the thing is... This is, this is going to be a difference between Excel and the program that I used to use. With Excel, on a cell, you can put in just about anything you want. You can put in an equation. You can put in letters. You can put in numbers. You can put in fractions. You can put in perhaps other symbols. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but we'll just go with that, right? But with the program that I used to use... As you set up your attribute table, you had to specify what kind of attribute was it? Was it a qualitative or a quantitative? So are you going to be using numbers in this cell or not? Okay. So in this case, we are looking at passion as a countable attribute. We're going to say that passion either has a value of like zero or passion has a value of 100 or whatever it is. But maybe that's incorrect. Maybe passion can can be expressed without numbers. I don't know. It's something to think about. Maybe maybe we can observe passion without numbers. Maybe we're not going to give passion levels or numbers. I don't know. But we still really haven't, per se, um, defined passion very well. 
you would have to have some definition for it in order to know what the appropriate um, data type to, to put to it. Um, but as I noted earlier, I don't think that just generically speaking, there is any right answer for this data type. It's more of um, these are the nine things which describe the material and we can describe any one of these nine things however makes sense to us humans right uh, as simple as so. complicated as we want yeah that. that's that was my point in noting yeah what, what you just repeated so okay um, so so far i have basically put forward my first thoughts i don't even want to call it an argument because i think that sounds pretentious my first thoughts about why i don't totally see why passion exists independently here or why it, it must be on its own in this list uh, because so far I see it being expressed through action so maybe it could be like a subheading under action or something like that I don't know um, but beyond that we can also go to the other question of can we expand this and go beyond just 10 accidental ones can we or, or can we not the yes or no the straight answer is yes of course we can but what would that be like and i don't know i, I don't know yet i don't have a, a straight answer for that per se because i'm still just trying to understand the nine that are there so i don't know what other things we would want to to put on here what about um emotion is emotion different from passion Or is emotion a quality? Or is it a state? Is it an action of a subset of the mind? Mm -hmm. And these are all good questions, I think. Um, my, but it's almost just a repeat of my initial question of can we add or remove? It's begging you to assert something. So if we're open for assertions, then uh, I will make an assertion. It seems like because because of what Jonathan has said, I think his, his idea of categorization possesses real value. Um, passion doesn't, I, I take issue with it being a material accident. Uh, you could maybe say that passion is evidence of a immortal soul going back to one of Jacob's questions if you take what Jonathan has said that passion doesn't seem to fit I think it doesn't fit and there's a reason for that that that's a that's a meaningful thing that it seems like it shouldn't be on the list because it doesn't really fit well the human soul doesn't fit the eternality of the human soul doesn't fit it's it's rather absurd that the human soul should be different from the rest of observable order i don't know if that makes any sense yeah so that that that's pretty interesting let's hold on to that thought and use it as We'll use that. I'm going to use that as a springboard, unless someone else wants to put something in. Let's use these 10 categories really quickly on a hypothetical man. Okay. So I'm just going to kind of go down this. And if someone else has other answers or has, has a way to put in something where I'm faltering or going off base, then go ahead and put it in. Let's start off with the first one. Substance, right? Substance is as I was just thinking about uh, and expressed aloud, I don't know if this is always true, but in the case of, of a man, we're going to say that it is binary. It's on or off. So in this case, I interpret substance as body or no body. Talking about a man, does he have a body or no body? He has a body, so we say, okay, good. Substance is, is good, so we're going to go on ahead. Quantity on this man could be any number of things as we've already said with jacob uh, jacob has said 
It could be as complicated or simple as we want. So I'm going to say quantity is just height or weight. That's fine. So quantity on this man, six feet. Quality on this man. There's several different ways you could do this. I don't know. The first thing that honestly comes to my mind is race. So I'm going to say quality, a black man. So we have man with a body, quantity six foot tall. He's quality. He's a black man. Relation, we have a lot of different things we could put in here. Uh, but we're just, I'm going to just limit it to relations to other humans. Let's say relation is, say, son. So he's a six foot tall black man. He's a son, has a body. Action. I don't know. Does anybody want to put it in action there? Does it matter? He's working. Uh, working. Yeah, let's say, yeah, work. That's fine. So six foot tall, black, uh, sun, working, passion. We'll skip for now. Place. I like Nashville, Tennessee. What's that? Yeah, okay. Like Nashville, Tennessee. Let's say, yeah, a real place on the earth, Nashville, that's fine. Time. Uh, as we determine time, I guess we could go with like year or day of the year. Uh, we can go with 14th of April today. Position. Again, we can make this apply in, in different ways. Uh, we could say position is maybe like the type of position he has in that work that Stephen just talked about, whatever that is. A boss, we can say he's a boss. And then state. Well, we could do that with emotion. Maybe he's feeling happy today. Maybe he's feeling sad today. I don't know. We'll, we'll, I'll just go ahead and say that state for in this case applies to emotion. So this is pretty materialistic, right? Uh, we've gone down with a lot of outside observable attributes about this man. And if we want to think about what Brandon was just saying, Passion is like the back door into this list for the soul. Maybe. Because as Brandon has said, um, and, and as I have said, I, I don't understand exactly how passion gets used here. And, and I was saying that to me, it seems like it could go into action. Brandon was kind of suggesting that as well, unless you want to use passion as the place where you would put in any data about the non-human. If I may plug something in here. Mm -hmm. If we agree with the definition of the soul as an animating force, let's say passion as an animating force. In this case, action is merely the evidence of an animating force. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you cannot say that passion and action are the same thing. And I don't think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah. But uh, as a result, you couldn't necessarily take passion off the list entirely as a meaningful attribute or accident. But I am tracking with what you say as far as it being. My first point was, my first point was to say, okay. Steven, your microphone's muted. Come back. Maybe he doesn't want to talk. I forgot that my microphone's muted. Can I say something? Sure, go ahead. Brandon just did it. I just looked up. Because I thought it was something. I just looked up Scotus's position on the action versus passion. And Scotus obviously separated the two, which was a very big deal. Thomas Aquinas did not separate the two. And he, like, attacked him for it. Um, what Scotus said was that they are distinct, distinct entities. And the words he used were action is the agent and passion is in the patient, meaning the action is like an outward thing that happens and passion is an inward thing that happens. So like what, kind of what Jacob said earlier, but more specifically what Brandon said just now is exactly what Scotus was um, lobbying for. And I just wanted to like say, hooray, Brandon, <laughs> you came to the thought that the, <laughs> the author was intending. Well, there you go. God knows how that <laughs> so, happened. Okay, 
we've been kind of on this one for i don't know maybe 40 minutes or so um what i find really interesting is you know i posed the question can we outthink scottis and i don't we're just now getting to the place where we're starting to think like him so that's good um <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that this actually Oof. gives a lot of um, credence to Scotus and his work. The fact that um, these categories, these forms that he had come up with and listed out um, probably were very thoughtful. And uh, they at least are hard to attack in our kind of casual discussion manner. So um, I'm fine with taking what I've just said as sort of an answer to my my question of can we you know add or remove and say well maybe but it's hard um and perhaps to move on to the further parts of book club okay sure i mean uh i don't per se have anything else i uh, i don't have anything else to add on to that i think that uh brandon's point which also is scotus point of passion sort of is as i said sort of the back door for the soul to get into this list uh, or, as Stephen was saying, the inward patient as opposed to the outward agent. expression or agent. Uh, that, that's good. That's fine. So uh, my, my f I was not trying to take a really strong position and ask the passion to be taken off the list. I was just trying to ask, why is it there and why is it asserted separately? Why is it asserted separately from action? And it seems that we just answered why is it asserted as se distinct, separate mm -hmm. from action. So that's fine. So I've been recording for an hour and 40. Um, keep that in mind while we go through these critical thinking questions, I suppose. And, I actually, uh, I don't have one because Jacob literally asked the question I was going to ask. So it happens. Mea culpa. Well, that's good. Then we've discussed it. And um, on to uh, Jonathan, do you have a question? I, I I feel like I've used up all my time and <laughs> most of my energy on this one I've already been going on. <laughs> well, that's okay, too. <laughs> so uh, I, I would say that's kind of like my question. And I think that it's kind of fun because we actually, sometimes my questions and other people's questions, we don't necessarily get to a final conclusion on them. I think it's nice that uh, Stephen did a little bit of legwork for us, and we kind of actually got to a real conclusion on the question that I put forward about why they're asserting those separately. So, no, I'm not going to put anything else out there. So on to Stephen. Your critical thinking question? I did have a question that's entirely unrelated to everything we've said, so I guess it's still valid. <laughs> Aristotle and Duns Scotus both talk about the idea of virtue or uh, righteousness, meaning right action. Um, so virtue or right actions, they both talk about that, the idea of that. And they both advocate that you can be or become virtuous and you can choose right action they, they both advocate that now that flies in the face obviously of a christian doctrine saying that apart from christ you're dead in your trespasses and sins you cannot choose truly right action you cannot choose virtue so the question i wanted to pose here um, I guess maybe like two versions of the question. Uh, why do these two people, a uh, pagan and a Christian, if you will, agree that righteousness or right action, virtue is achievable? Uh, and the second question is, are they right? That's good. So they define, are you saying that they strictly define the word achievable as in achievable in a strictly human sense, 
or achievable in the sense of we know there's an idea of perfection. We know there's an idea of virtue. So it might be achievable to be virtuous. Achievable as in you can do it. Okay. One important distinction to make up front here, though, is I, I believe they both do consider the highest virtue to be a quality of God or the unmoved mover, if you will. Um, and doing it would be something along the lines of moving towards that, making progress in growing in virtue. Is that right? Yes. I mean, it's always harder with Aristotle because he's so technical, but yeah, the that for the sake of which the, the divine mover, the idea is there. Okay, Stephen, can I just uh, have you sort of repeat any questions you have here? I'm trying to sort of write it down. The first question is something along the lines of why do these two people, a pagan and a Christian, both agree that virtue is achievable? Is there anything else beyond that? The second one, which is probably impossible. No, no, just the first one, though. First, I just want to say achievable. Are you implying achievable on your own or achievable as a man or anything else or just achievable? I really mean just achievable. You could say possible instead of achievable, but no, no, qual no qualifiers because I could not find any qualifiers okay. in their works. And the second one was? Are they right? Are they right? And that one is maybe not answerable. We shall see. Well, this probably deserves some analysis of how they got to their definitions of virtue, etc., uh, which I kind of already touched on by saying they both consider virtue to be a perfectly held by God or the unmoved mover. So with that in mind, their uh, understanding of virtue with relation to human is really quite evident. Human is a creation of the unmoved mover um, or of God. So perhaps this creation can seek out the virtue of their creator. So are you essentially saying that virtue is supernatural and therefore by moving towards that supernatural, we can, it is achievable? I'm saying that that's why they've both come to this conclusion is yes, they both in their somewhat different ways did, even though Aristotle, you, you called him pagan. I mean, he did talk quite a bit about God. Um, and God was, you know, had this, this grand, perfect virtue. So um, I'm just saying how they've both come to that, that uh, conclusion that, yeah, you know, humans as creations of God can move towards that virtue that God has. I think that they've really arrived at, at, you know, basically through the same route, as you've noted, in spite of their differing uh, knowledge and time uh, when they were around. So a simple kind of self-evident, you know, starter answer. <laughs> it's really all I'm posing here. Mm -hmm. I actually was thinking about this today. I was thinking, is it possible to give a logical proof for total depravity, uh, which seems to be kind of the direction that you are headed. Because uh, obviously if total depravity is true, and again, for our listeners, total depravity being the, the utter evil of the human, the inability to desire good, to act in a way that is good, if that is true, then, you know, neither Scotus or Aristotle are correct. Um, but if we're looking at this strictly from a logical standpoint, from um, bereft of faith um, or a deep self-knowledge, I can't really say that Aristotle or Scotus are wrong. So another thing on Brandon's point here is actually how they both defined, defined virtue um, might be particularly of 
interest when we say, uh, and are they right? Um, obviously, they're wrong if their definition of virtue is wrong. But if we take their definitions of virtue for what they are, um, you know, I would I would pose that yeah, you can get to their definitions of virtue. Mm. So that's kind of part two of Stephen's question. I say what I just said. Yeah, they don't define virtue high enough. Therefore, of course, it's achievable because it's not the right definition of virtue. Possibly. Yeah, and and that might be very important to recognize because say you, you go out and you ask a random person on the street, um, you know, here in Western culture, uh, you, you could ask them any number of questions. For like, is it possible to be a good person? Or you could ask them, is being a good person, being a virtuous person, the same thing, or is it different? And I feel like you'd get a lot of answers that are basically, yeah, you be a good person. Being a good person is being a virtuous person. That's all one and the same, obvious. I feel like that's probably the context of most of our time. Most of humanity, I, I would pause it. I think that's the context of Aristotle and Scotus both. Oddly enough, that was uh, that's a satisfactory answer for me. What do you guys think? Jonathan, do you have an answer? I do have an answer. It's not necessarily very well organized. Well, you have a slightly more vivacious mind than I, me, at least, so I would very much like to hear it. Okay. Well, it's it's not very well organized, but um, the answer, my basic response to the first question, why do these two people, a pagan and a Christian, both agree that virtue is achievable? My answer is because of course it is. Of course it is achievable. The, 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 I, I don't understand why you would necessarily assert that it's not achievable. What's that? So basically you're just saying, of course it is via logic of, you know, achievable. Well, the, just... yeah, I suppose you could say there's logic to it um, per se, but, but my reason would be, of course it's achievable because of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Okay, so that goes to a spiritual <laughs> dimension. We'll come. With, you know, but that doesn't people... that doesn't answer why they've both come to that conclusion. Because if you said Holy Spirit to either of them, I mean, you know, you're, you're going to get very different answers. What even that is? Hmm. Eudaimonia. Yeah, eudaimonia versus. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again, Jacob. Could you say that again, please? I mean, if, if you said, of course it is because the Holy Spirit. Of course, mm -hmm. virtue is... The, if you said that to them, to Aristotle and to Scotus, they would understand that very different ways. Aristotle would translate that probably into eudaimonia, the good and dwelling spirit. And Scotus would have something closer to the biblical definition of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So what would be the biblical definition of the Holy Spirit? The biblical definition of the Holy Spirit for me is the Spirit. This one. Thanks. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit from God which convicts of sin and which guides in righteousness. Is that a good starting working definition or should we give something more? The Holy Spirit is the one who testifies about. The rightness of God. Is that adequate enough, or do we need to do anything more? I'm okay with I'm that. This is your framework. Start with that. <laughs> so, if we're going to say that, you know, God is that source of, of all the virtue, and you allow the Holy Spirit to give you guidance on that, moving toward that 
virtue, then you can become virtuous. I, I think it's very important to make a distinction for Stephen, the idea of can you become and is it possible for a human to become? Because this is where you have the difference of the idea of the depravity of um, human nature. But the, the other reason that I would immediately say that, of course, it's possible to become virtuous is because you can become virtuous by keeping the law. Depending on exactly how you want to define the law and everything like that, but let's just say we use the law of Moses. If you keep the law of Moses perfectly, then you will be perfectly virtuous. Is that a good assertion or not? Mm -hmm. Excellent assertion. It's, yeah. it's an excellent assertion. That's the whole purpose of the law. So is it possible to do that? Yes, it is possible. Can human beings do that? The evidence is very much in the contrary. It's a really interesting and meaningful paradox. It's a can and can't situation. So the it's only one that, according to different belief, specifically Christian belief, the only person who ever accomplished that was a god-man. Was the embodiment of the Logos on earth, Jesus of Nazareth. And he maintained the entire law and was blameless and was completely virtuous before God. So, why do these two people, a pagan and a Christian, both agree that virtue is achievable? Because we have a way to understand virtue as the law. The other way that I would talk about it is that I've been going through and studying and reading in the book of Romans, and even if you don't want to take Romans as holy writ, even if you only want to take it as historical writing, the historical writing and period for that book comes from the Roman Empire under the, uh, the Emperor Nero. And so there's a context for that writing when the author, Paul, is writing about people rejecting truth and corrupting others and, uh, and then going off into the depravity of their minds. So, in that case, I would say that it's very, it's very much still on the table that virtue is achievable. But the underlying, I guess, the simple summary from a Christian point of view would be the underlying spirit for, un, for most people, would, that, that spirit is not going to be enough to encourage you that spirit is not going to be enough to animate you, as I was reading in my definition earlier, to achieve virtue. Because that spirit is opposed to the law, as written about in Galatians. Right? That's the flesh. The flesh and the law, and these two are at constant opposition, so they're at war with each other, and so you don't do what you want. That's what's written about in, in the end of the book of Galatians. But the idea of Christianity is that you can replace that spirit with a new spirit, which is a virtuous spirit because it is a godly spirit. And if God is the complete example of virtue, then the godly spirit will, by definition, point you toward God and point you toward virtue, taking you along. It doesn't necessarily point you at virtue. It just takes you along. I would say, <clears throat> I would say it takes you along the road of virtue to God or toward God. So I don't expect Aristotle to have that kind of vocabulary. I don't even know if I would necessarily expect him to have that kind of total revelation. But I think that I think that it's completely right to say that virtue is achievable. Next question is how, I suppose. Because if virtue cannot be achieved, then life is meaningless. If we are using virtue as a as an attribute of God, right? If we're using virtue as one of the things that comes out of God, and if we want to say that humankind is moving toward trying to grasp it or trying to, to get it, if you're going to say that's impossible, then life is completely meaningless. 
that that's just really really basic nihilism there is no virtue so you can you can do one of two things in this situation you can either assert that god is and even assert virtue if you want as a secondary cause and then assert that virtue is unreachable at that point life becomes meaningless or you can deny god at all and then the first cause for the second cause of virtue does not exist and so virtue doesn't really exist so both of those are forms of nihilism or total materialism you know irreducible materialism or something like that so i don't really you know and you you ask your question as you wanted to that's fine but i i don't think it's right at all to say that virtue is unachievable that there's no reason for that are they right in the second question would be are they right in assuming that virtue is achievable as i just gave some evidence for yes because if virtue is unachievable then life is meaningless now we haven't gone through the entire um, process of how to achieve virtue or where the spirit that guides you toward virtue along the virtue road toward the unmoved mover of God or however you want to say it. We haven't talked about that whole process, how it works, who knows what, do pagans know it, do Christians know it, and all those kind of things. But are they right in assuming that? I would say absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Because the alternative is um, is depravity. Hmm. Yeah, I, I love it when you can answer yes to two seemingly contradictory statements and both of them be true. It's one of my favorite things. I want to say that I did not share that question with Jonathan beforehand. I have not spoken with Jonathan in a while. It <laughs> was just the, uh, the fruit of an examined life that uh, Jonathan is living. I just want to I suppose you could say it's it's the point number 10 of the category list. It's the state. Um, the state. Credence to that. So this question is interesting to me because, you know, Scotus wrote some about ethics as well. Aristotle wrote about ethics. But the basis for their ethics, in my opinion, seems to be found in metaphysics. I... Uh, and this idea of virtue is laced through both of those. So, you know, this is all part of what a lot of people call virtue ethics, virtue ethics. Virtue ethics are no longer popular or accepted amongst academia in our day, almost at all. Um, and yet, as you very eloquently just described, no matter what perspective you look at it from, um, the disbelief in the possibility of virtue is just nihilism, mm -hmm. hopeless and pointless. So, yeah, that's why I asked that question, because I find that, I think that that's really important. I'd agree. And is this, uh, is this, Jesh Jacob should help me out with this, if this is Plato's quote, or if it's Aristotle's. I think it's Plato's quote that says, the unexamined life is not, is the life not worth living? I think that's Plato. That's Plato, right? Yeah, I think, I think so. so. So, to me, this is this is just like another footnote onto the question that, that you just asked uh, of these things. And you know, if you deny the idea of virtue, and either of those two ways that I mentioned, that one virtue is unobtain is unreachable, unobtainable. Uh, if virtue is either unreachable or two, the head of virtue does not exist, and therefore. There's no basis to build virtue on anything. Uh, then I don't know where your examined life is going to come from. <laughs> and if you want to believe Plato, then that life is not worth living. And so that's meaningless. Meaninglessness. Mm -hmm. That quote is from uh, Plato's Apology, uttered by you know Socrates um, shortly before his death or after he was sentenced anyways. 
I am satisfied. Yeah, that was um, a, a fairly thorough answer, and I think it went a little bit even past the question. Um, but that that shows the strength and intent of that question. So um, yeah, it's it's an important question. Yeah, a couple other notes. Um, maybe I could have mentioned them before, but uh, actually I dropped my notes, uh, which were on my phone in the bathtub a couple nights ago and uh <laughs> so i actually had to write this whole monologue without my notes which i had been accumulating for over a month um oh, no so i think it went off very well i, it I, did. I think yeah. thank you guys um yeah. what i what i resorted to was a little bit of a different uh scope and and yeah i i, I really like this scope um but yeah all, all my notes on aristotle were there i had some on scotus elsewhere so and then the other thing was this month, technically, we were examining all of um, Scotus's works, but I only did metaphysics. Um, so I only focused on metaphysics. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's kind of where the critical thinking questions can, can be elaborated was like Stephen mentioned, this is more of a virtue ethics question. Um, and that certainly is within the scope of Aristotle's metaphysics and Duns Scotus. Um, just in general. So yeah, if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and uh, thank you guys for participating. It was actually quite a nice week, I think. It was. I think it was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks to everybody else as well who made it possible. All right.